Deep in the safety of the Amazon rainforest, there's a very special tree. Here, the Brazil nut tree is the monarch of the forest, where it towers above the forest canopy and can live as long as 1,500 years. For a few months of every year, the tree produces fruit that ensures its future. Its shell is impregnable, except for the furry five and a half pound mammal called the agouti. The agouti's sharp teeth have evolved to allow it to pierce through the shell and feast on the treasure inside. They eat what they can, then bury the remaining nuts for another day. Luckily for the tree, the agouti often forgets where they are, ensuring that a few will sprout and become the next generation of Brazil nut trees. Such interdependent relationships have been developing in the rainforest for millions of years. But remove one part of the equation and the whole natural system can unravel. Scientists say the Earth is 4.7 billion years old. To us, the Earth seems permanent, so it's easy to believe it will never change. The home of the Brazil nut tree is the Amazon rainforest. It covers over a billion acres, occupying huge regions of Brazil, Venezuela, Colombia, Bolivia, Ecuador, and Peru. If Amazonia were a country, it would be the ninth largest in the world. But this is a country unlike any other. Of the Earth's 10 million species of plants, animals, and insects, almost one third live here. And the Amazon's forests are so vast, they actually help moderate the Earth's weather. But in recent years, our excessive demands on the Amazon's natural resources have started an imbalance that could result in losing all of this in a very short time. Concerned about the deforestation, Peruvian biologist Enrique Ortiz documented the destruction with a disturbing aerial photograph that shocked the world. This is a wasteland created by a new and growing threat. Sensing a need for the world to see, a documentary team travels to Peru's Amazon rainforest to investigate the problem. The team's leader was the author of that striking photograph, Enrique Ortiz. I used to be a scientist. You know, today I'm not. Today I'm more um, an activist, uh, somehow a politician. As a scientist, I study animals here and there. And then later on, I went to the same places and I didn't find them anymore. I just began to be an activist out of outrage, out of seeing things that should not be. And then I said, I said look, got to do something about it. We went down to have a look at gold mining because gold mining is one of the underlying um, things that's destroying this enormous, intact rainforest. Donovan Webster is a cutting-edge journalist and war correspondent who has written groundbreaking exposés for leading magazines. What I want to do is talk to the people who are doing it, the people who are being dragged behind its force. I just want to hear from them. Ron Haviv is a world-renowned photographer whose powerful images documenting war have changed public policy. His photos have been used to hold people accountable, covering wars from Bosnia to Rwanda. I became very uh, involved in making sure that 
there was a historical document, uh, there was evidence that would come out of these places to tell the world what was happening and to hold people responsible. So they don't have the excuse to say, oh, I didn't know that was happening. Donovan Webster and I went to Iraq together to do a story about the black prison sites that the Americans were running. And it was a very intense story, it was a very important story, and it was a story in the middle of a war zone, in the middle of a very um, dangerous war. Uh, we were attacked uh, while we were there, and the story that we did, I hope, had real impact. We felt very empowered by that idea that the work that we can do together can have some sort of effect and some sort of, hopefully, change for good. So when Donovan and I decided to go to, to Peru, and to, it was almost an immediate understanding that while this wasn't something that involved people shooting at each other, this really was about uh, destruction. And very, very similar to what, we, what I've done and what he's done in documenting wars. The team has been asked to document another kind of war, where the battlefield is deceptively green and the casualties not yet counted. As the team's boat drifts down the river, it's flanked by giant trees, and Enrique reminds everyone that the trees are far more valuable left standing than cut down. These forests are humanity's first line of defense against climate change. If they fall, we fall with them. Today, the issue of climate change is in the mouth of everybody, it's in the eyes of everybody. And you have to understand that this forest has a big role in regulating climate. So this forest is, in some way, the one that is the keeper of these cycles that maintain the water levels, that maintain patterns of climate, that at the end, if we keep going in the pace that we're going today, it is going to affect all of us. And I don't mean all of us, the people in this region, the locals or the Peruvians. We're talking about a global scale. Every time a tree is cut down or burned, carbon dioxide is released into the atmosphere, pushing worldwide levels even higher. Every factory, every machine, every fire, everything powered by fossil fuels produces carbon emissions and adds to the slow but steady warming of our planet. Many scientists now believe deforestation will help accelerate climate change to catastrophic levels before the end of the century with unforeseeable consequences. Around a bend in the river, instead of seeing wildlife and vegetation, the team starts passing mounds of rocks and debris like some monster had eaten up the earth and spread out the bones. And then they see the cause, barges. Basically, there are floating factories which have these enormous pumps and they are extracting dirt from the bottom of the river, getting the gold out of it. Rivers bring the sediments down from the Andes, where they are pumped up from the river bottom and forced into a sluice where the tiny flakes of gold fall through. Most of these barges are illegal. The families that operate them often live on board. I think one of the most remarkable things about this is that you see all the different ways people are trying to do it. You have people actually living sort of on houseboats uh, in the middle of the river where they've got all the tools and they're living there and they're basically mining almost 24 hours a day. They're actually even entire families with children that are doing that, living on these barges and mining for gold. The damage seems small, but the United Nations estimates that between 10 million and 15 million small mining operations, many like this, are at work in the world today all the way from Peru to Mongolia. What we're seeing here is an example of something that's happening all along the Amazon. We're seeing a boom of gold extraction. 
The boom is a direct response to the world markets. The quest for economic certainty establishes the price of gold. Gold is one of the few metals that has risen in price in recent years, and in fact, gone up to an all-time high. Governments, like people, have always stored gold, believing in its value in hard economic times when it's tough to believe in anything else. In countries where incomes are rising, a new market has emerged for gold jewelry, as more people can afford to indulge in gold than ever before. A few more miles up the river, Enrique says, now I'm going to show you the real price of gold. Amazing. These miners liquefy huge blocks of earth and pump them onto enormous sluices nearby. The process is voracious. It has taken the miners a week to destroy a habitat that took millions of years to evolve. Two to four people can die in a week in these mining camps from sudden mudslides all for the price of gold. They just wash the mats. So this is a more concentrated sand that is loaded with, with gold. If you fine tune your eyes, you can see some shine. That's what they call the shine. El brillo. For every ounce of gold extracted, the miners add an equal amount of mercury. The metal mercury is generally a liquid, and it has a particular affinity for gold. Poured into a slurry with tiny flecks of gold, the mercury binds to them, making them easy to retrieve. Mercury-laced water and other industrial waste is discarded into the river. Then the mercury is burned off the remnants, leaving a nugget of gold. But it's not just the miners that expose themselves to this deadly element. Mercury particles are carried miles away by wind and rivers. The burning process releases about 100 tons of mercury every year into the Amazon atmosphere. The tiny particles enter the food chain by being taken up by bacteria, which are eaten by small fish, which are then eaten by larger fish. At each stage, the amount of mercury accumulates. At the end of the food chain, it is eaten by people, where the toxins do enormous damage, especially to children, who are the most vulnerable neurologically. This invisible threat 
is as limitless and pervasive as the very air it infiltrates, contaminating everything it touches. Because it doesn't break down, mercury remains in an ecosystem for decades, often for centuries, affecting the forest, the water, and the living beings that dwell there. For people, mercury exposure can cause lower IQs, weakened immune systems, aggression, organ damage, and a possible shortened lifespan. Research has shown that three out of four people tested in Madre de Dios have toxic levels of mercury in their systems, some as high as 33 times above healthy limits. Sadly, Indigenous children living in the forest are the most affected. So far, scientists have only tested the people. No one knows how mercury will alter the plants and animals. Por día. 70. 70. 70. 70. ¿Y cuánto tiempo estás haciendo eso? Desde... Yo recién voy dos años, de los 18, tengo 21 años ahorita recién. The finished nugget will be sold, and the profits divided among the four miners, with the percentage going to the operator of the mine. You just to get an idea of the intensity of the work, it's 24 hours a day. And that'd be whole. Yeah, we just saw it took 13 days to be made. Using like dynamite or it's all no, from digging? It's just digging. In 13 days they made a huge hole. And then if you go probably 40 meters behind, there is another one like that. Gregorio, cuéntame todo lo que ves desde ahí. Acá todo se mira. Todo lo que estamos ahorita acá, se mira por allá, todo el río, tanto acá, eso también. No one thinks about the whole 40 meters away or the whole 40 meters beyond that or the whole 40 meters beyond that. What they think about is, this is my hole, and at the end of today, I'm going to make 80 bucks. And then you know what? When this hole doesn't play out anymore, I'll make a new hole. At first glance, it's almost like looking at the Grand Canyon in America, but then when you actually start to really understand what you're looking at, sort of this rapid transformation of the Earth that one looks at in terms of the history of happening over hundreds of years or thousands of years, and here it's happening over days. You know, the world needs gold. That's what Peru makes a lot of money out, and the same as any other minerals. But the point is that it cannot be just anywhere. And in some ways, by allowing gold extraction anywhere, you are killing the goose of a golden ex. You know, the, the long-term vision uh, is not based on something that you're gonna extract and then just leave and leave it totally uh, destroyed. It may take 
decades to be a functional system anymore, centuries in some cases. For every miner that leaves this tough life behind, there are plenty more willing to take his place. As we move upriver, we wonder if the forest will ever get the chance to heal. It's a fast-growing city. The migration rate in this area is twice anywhere in the country. There is an average of perhaps 100 families moving every day. Everybody's coming to this region because it's a land of opportunity. They see that they can make a living here. One of the things that was really important was to show how this mining really affected not only the miners, but affected an environmentalist, affected a shopkeeper, a hotel owner, uh, a taxi driver. I mean, they were all completely interconnected through the gold mining. Any attempt to change it was going, not just going to affect a few miners, was really going to affect an entire community. I didn't meet any owners of the illegal mines, so I just met the workers. Almost everyone that I spoke to would say, I'm gonna work here for six months, I'm gonna work here for a year, I'm gonna take my money and go back to my village. This was a real economic survivability issue. As migrants move into the Amazon, destruction is rolling out in the opposite direction. The new roads being built throughout South America are making it easier to haul out these ancient trees that previously had been too remote to exploit. New roads mean more demands on the forest, more cleared areas, more pollution, more machines, and more destruction of the rainforest. Scientists say that 95% of all deforestation occurs within 30 miles of a road. The ecological impact of the road itself is tremendous. When a road cuts through the forest, not only does it affect the ability of indigenous peoples and animals to travel their normal paths for food, but it also causes the area to dry out. Since 2000, an area of nearly 50 soccer fields has been destroyed every minute across the Amazon, a total loss that is 10 times the size of the United Kingdom. Current research has shown that the rampant deforestation of the Amazon is wreaking havoc on the regional and global weather patterns. Scientists have now cited links between the destruction of the Amazon and increases in rainfall as far away as East Africa and reduced rainfall thousands of miles away in California and the west coast of the United States. In the next 24 hours, deforestation and the burning of trees worldwide will release as much carbon dioxide into the atmosphere as eight million people flying from London to New York. The team detours into an unspoiled section of rainforest 
to get a feel for what's at stake. But when you enter the rainforest, when you're in this amazing world of biodiversity, within like, you know, five feet, you're all of a sudden you're just surrounded, you're engulfed. Everything else sort of falls behind. And you start to understand really how interconnected all of this is with, with the rest of the world. And it's a very overwhelming experience. The rainforest is, you know, by all means, the most spectacular place it can ever be. You know, I always equal it with a cathedral. You know, it's a place you enter and it just overwhelms you with such a grandiosity. This forest is, is Noah's Ark. 30% of the species in the planet are in only in a relatively small range of this geography. This tree is uh, the longest living tree in, in the Amazon. There are some records of probably 1,500-year-old trees. Every piece of its natural history, reproduction, sea dispersal, you name it, depends on very exclusive set of organisms that are specialized only in this tree. Trees like this are home to hundreds of different plants, animals, and insects. One single tree in Peru was found to have 43 different species of ants, a total that approximates the entire number of ant species in all of the United Kingdom. Interdependent relationships in the rainforest have been developing for millions of years. leaves Puerto Maldonado and enters the very heart of gold mining operations. But all of a sudden you come up over this one hill and there's no trees anymore. And all of a sudden in the distance, way over there, and between you and the Andean foothills is a plain that is brown mud. That is the spoils of Huapetue. Huapetue City began 30 years ago when gold was discovered along a river so small that you could wade across it. All this used to be pure rainforest. Today, it is the center of gold mining in this part of the Amazon. Already, the entire town has been forced to move twice to escape the invading silt that is washed downstream from gold mines, ironically burying Waipetwe in the waste from the same rainforest that they have destroyed. Waipetwe resembles photos from mining camps that rose up in the U.S. along the California-Nevada border in the 1850s. The streets are muddy with ankle-deep puddles. The houses are up on stilts, and the stores are up on stilts, and there's a boardwalk. 
They're selling universal joints and, and uh, those, those stacking plastic chairs, flip-flops and boots, and you know, lots and lots of cell phones. It's just, it is literally like a smash and grab town. And of course, there are dozens of places on Main Street ready to buy and sell gold. Something about gold. When you work gold, it just works so nicely. It's, I don't know, it's something about it. It dresses nuts. You've got it. You've got gold here. I'm. Everyone has it. Poco a poco, tal vez año a año, algo bueno se está recibiendo, no lo mucho, porque hay muchas necesidades que existen en nuestro pueblo. No todos somos mineros también, como dicen, ¿no? grandes mineros, ganan tanto. No somos grandes m
Here and there, a committed activist tries to form a center of opposition, sometimes with modest success. In this area, principally, the people like to cure themselves with plants, medicinal plants, in terms of general. In the last instance, they recur to the hospital or the pharmacy, etc., etc. Esta partecita está... ¿Está rica? Esta parte está buena. Esta ya está un poquito más dolorita. He's a guy who was 20 years in the Navy. He was a Marine in Peru. And then he came back to see the family where he grew up, and then he found that most of the area was totally deforested and it was drying out. And he said, wait a second. This is not what I remember it used to be, all the plentiful place that I used to enjoy when I was a kid. And this guy started to organize uh, himself, his neighbors, and then all the region. Que la verdad, estamos sumamente, digamos, este, 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 presionados por todos lados, sobre todo de intereses económicos muy grandes que hay aquí en la región. En ese caso hablamos de la minería, de la eh, madera. Principalmente minería, tala ilegal, este, cómo se llama, y actividades, pues, mejor dicho, la corrupción, pues. Y como saben que aquí no hay autoridad. El principio de autoridad no existe en sí eh, que los pueda eh, fiscalizar. En realidad, pues, vienen y, y se meten donde sea, hacen su actividad, porque nadie le dice absolutamente nada. Uh -huh. Y eso es lo que estamos tratando de enderezar en la medida de nuestras posibilidades. ¿no? Pero hay, hay apoyo a la población. Hemos tenido un operativo ahí en la zona de Santa Rosa, porque queremos conservar la zona de la cumbre que es una montaña sumamente dinámica, que hay biodiversidad pues, en gran cantidad. Y ese, personalmente, ha sido siempre mi sueño conservarlo. Y justamente la población que está más abajo, que es Santa Rosa, ha decidido, digamos, conservar esa zona y erradicar a todos los este, posesionarios ilegales que están ubicados allí. Y eso, en realidad, es, una, es un respaldo del pueblo. has taken the responsibility and in some ways a risk uh, of facing other forces. And I say a risk because uh, behind many of these destructive forces there are mafias. For example, the logging mafias kill people. And he believes this is worth risking his life for? Nuestra región eh, es tan inmensa, tan rica, tan diversa, que no solamente vale la pena esto, sino muchos otros esfuerzos. Victor Zambrano is a leader today, and he is, to me, a smaller version of, a, of an Nelson Mandela. With his vision and clarity of solutions, and also putting an example himself. He's not only talking, you know, he himself, his farm, his small farm, became to be a model. So guys like Victor Zambrano make, make a change. Beyond Huaypetue, far into the heart of the rainforest where no one goes, where visitors are distinctly unwelcome, is La Mal, said to be the outpost of a new explosion of illegal mining, rarely seen by outsiders. We need to find a way of getting in and see what very few have been able to see. A number of uh, people have tried and they have found violence. Um, and they were not able to, to uncover. So we need to be smart, we need to be safe. It is now uh, four, no, two minutes after four. Uh, we are in the kilometer one, 107. Uh, at the entrance of La Mal. The only way to get into the mining operations is with the motorcycles. Here, right now, we are getting uh, all uh, our staff together to get in. We have the motorcycles waiting for us. 
Um, at this time, people are still working. We're trying to get there early enough to see uh, the operations at night and then the shift of workers in the, in the mining. You're on the back of this motorbike. All you can see in front of you is the dot of a red tail light of another motorbike in front of you. The jungle begins to get patchier, and then patchier, and then patchier. And soon it's just a little chunks of trees there, chunks of trees there, and it's mud. And then you come to the first real village, and they let us off the motorcycles. We can hear a motor down somewhere over there. So we walk across this hill, and we come upon this enormous hole. This is a very bizarre scene. There are several operations here. Uh, there is a, a set of people working here. There is another one, like Around 200 four, feet. Yeah. There is another one at 500 feet. And it's just moving. It's so strange. Like an animal eating. It's amazing. Yeah. It's just. And in some ways, the vegetation is an obstacle here. Look at the logs. Yeah, that must good. make the work very difficult. Yeah, it's like really reminiscent of a, a place after a battle where there's been a lot of shelling. And you just see the trees like helter skelter that were hit by concussion or shrapnel or some fires that were started. So you have charred look and it's like it's almost exactly the same. Wait a second. Holy cow. Wait a second. This is a Brazilian tree. Holy cow. Yeah. This is a Brazilian tree. And this tree has no future. It's just at the edge, it's going to fall down very soon. Wow. God. Well. This is pristine forest. So it's a primary forest. It's a primary forest species. It wasn't until once it got light that you really sort of had an idea about the devastation of, of the environment. It's amazing that in that direction, all what you hear are motors. In that direction, you can hear the screaming pigas, dynamos, and all the animals. Those birds are calling to defend a territory that will not exist probably within a week.
It was astonishing. I mean, I, I, literally what it conjured to me was Hieronymus Bosch. That's what it conjured up to me, was this men with weirdly unique looking tools doing something in hell. That's what it reminded me of. Have you ever seen anything like this? No, this is beyond my expectations. This is um, it's pretty shocking. Is the value of this forest higher than the gold or not? Once you strike gold here, it's a one-time shot. Forest is a, a long-term provider. So yes, gold is, is a faster way to get cash. But that doesn't last too long. You come here, just get the gold and then go away. So as I walked away from the, the giant hole that they were mining in, and I walked into the pristine rainforest to see what it was like, the sounds of the chainsaws and the sounds of the, the drilling equipment became quieter and quieter, and the sounds of the forest became louder and louder. It's, it's really very hard to reconcile that idea in your mind that the miners are moving forward and everything that you see that's green ahead of you could all be gone. Whenever man wants more, it has to come from the earth. Once thought limitless, now its limitations are staring us in the face. What would it take for a hungry man, a desperate man, or a man who just wants more for his children to say, I cannot cut down a beautiful forest that took thousands of years to grow. It's a fact that the forest provides us to something that is very important all the time, constantly, and we just don't value it. You only appreciate things when you lose them. It's too late. You know, this is providing us today with important things, the air we breathe, you know, the water we drink, the climate that we enjoy. Would you let the people living next to Machu Picchu take the stones and sell them because they are poor? No, of course not. You know, we actually have to provide with something else, but don't take the stones from Machu Picchu because you are poor. You know, I get a guy who's trying to make enough money to make sure that when he goes to bed at night, he knows tomorrow morning when he wakes up, he's not gonna starve or die or have to steal something. I get that, but it's impossible for people who live 70 years to measure how long it's gonna take for a 500-year-old tree to grow up and be an apex species in a forest. That's the part that depresses me to no end, is, is, is that we really don't even understand what it is we're taking away from our future.
30 segundos, Ricardo, para dar cuenta a nuestros amigos oyentes de la experiencia que fue sobrevolar la zona afectada por la minería ilegal en Madre de Dios. Eh, ya hemos visto imágenes en la televisión, reportajes periodísticos que dan cuenta del eh, daño causado por la minería ilegal, pero es, verlo... ¿Es tan malo como se ve en la foto, Guido? Es peor, es peor, es peor, porque ves, la foto te da la impresión de que es un pedacito. Estos son eh, 30.000 hectáreas devastadas y deforestación es un adjetivo insuficiente, es una verdadera devastación. Peruvian police on a raid of an illegal mining operation. The government launched an operation last year to destroy dredges. Now, major environmental concerns over mercury contamination at extensive gold mining operations in the remote regions of the Peruvian Amazon. A makeshift gold mine goes up in flames. The price of gold reached an all-time high this month, surpassing $1,800 an ounce. more than 100 police here, and they're bringing the fight to the miners. They've come in helicopter because it's just too far to get to by foot. Many miners are determined to fight. In March, three died while protesting against the new laws. Authorities say illegal gold mining is a $2.9 billion industry, moving more money than drug trafficking. And as long as the global price of gold remains high, this activity will continue. The Peruvian government faces tremendous obstacles in the battle to contain illegal gold mining. People who mine gold to escape poverty are only part of the story. To control gold mining means taking on organized crime that has both the cash to buy influence and the ruthlessness to intimidate opposition. Drug trafficking, money laundering, child exploitation, slave labor, and the cross-border smuggling of gold. Organized crime not only backs these activities in gold mining regions, but can also eliminate those who try to stop them. We went back to Peru to understand the aftermath of what had happened, and also to see, like, was it really true? Did these mines really shut down? Were their mines still working? Was it more of a publicity stunt? What happens when the, the people of these places disappear? I went back to Huapetue. I went back to an area that was called Lamal, which is where we, Donovan and I, had spent a lot of time. When I got there, it was completely deserted. I saw the, the results of the Peruvian intervention, which was that they blew up trucks, the sloughs as they were, they were destroyed, they, they blew up houses, they destroyed lots of uh, the mining infrastructure. Gold is a commodity that, that we're all involved in as part of our economic base. And so we have to understand that even though we might not be directly buying gold from the miner who's destroying the rainforest, everybody is part of this situation. And everybody's affected because the Amazon has such an important environmental impact on us. And so it really was a reminder that no matter how far away you go in the world, it will always come back to you at home wherever you are. Another obstacle is that the trail of illegal gold is hard to follow. How many of us can say where the gold we own originates? Could you, right now, be wearing gold that was illegally mined in the Amazon? How would you know? Undercover investigations have led to some breakthroughs. The major backers of illegal gold have been traced to a group of companies from the United States, Switzerland, Italy, and the United Arab Emirates. But the question remains, is this knowledge enough to bring reform to a global black market? Or will the price of gold once again be placed at a higher value than the cost to humans and to the earth? We're winning a number of battles. But my hope is that there will be this click where 
paradigm is going to change. I hope we don't go into disasters. I hope we don't go into cataclysms for, to get to that point. We are at that moment where if we are not acting, the scale goes in another direction. This is critical moment, you know, more than ever in history. Today, more than 50% of the Amazon is actually under some form of protection. It's indigenous lands, it's national parks, it's national forests, it's state protected areas, sustainable development reserves, securing the forest and its benefits uh, for people long term. What that says is there is a recognition of the importance of the Amazon. The big issue, however, is what happens outside of the protected area. The Amazon is at a real crossroads. It's very close to a tipping point. A tipping point, a crossroads, a last chance. That's how many describe this critical moment for the Amazon. In the pursuit of gold, perhaps we see this global crisis reflected most clearly expressed in a single word, greed. Will our greatness be overshadowed by our ravenous hunger for what is superficial? Will we choose a world that exploits the innocent, a world of greed, of degradation, of destruction that can ultimately threaten our very existence? Or will we decide that the real riches are in living together on this planet, in harmony and with respect? for all living things.